it's my pleasure to introduce Jessica Davis, who um, was the champion to get this going and bring together this rewarding team to work with on the SARE funded project. And she'll uh, explain a little more, and then we'll, at the end, we'll share these materials with you. So, Jessica? Hi, everyone. So, Tommy already mentioned that this is a whole group of people from four different land grants running from uh, uh, Montana down to New Mexico. And in addition, NRCS was an important player in this uh, program in developing and reviewing the materials and helping with dissemination. Uh, and in addition to our own internal team, we also had several people serve as uh, external reviewers or associate editors. So, so I'll just, I've already been introduced. I'll tell you who else is gonna uh, help me address this today. We're gonna tag team four of us and so after, um, after me, Michael Fisher, who's in the back, will, and then Tommy will come back up. He's an extension specialist from Montana State University. And then John Deering will round it out. He's another CSU extension uh, specialist with a focus in the ag economics and business side. So Tommy mentioned there were several different materials that we developed, and that was one of the primary goals of this project and they're up here. We've got a manual that we published in both English and in Spanish because of the uh, many Spanish-speaking people that work at feedlots and dairies in Colorado and New Mexico especially. We also have a video. Now John developed a budget and decision tool that he'll show you a little bit later on and then this is the PowerPoint. I don't want to fail to mention that this project was funded by the Western SARA program, the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education program that's part of USDA. So we'll get started talking a little about mortality management. There are several goals in mortality management. First goal is not to let the animals die, right? <laughs> but if, once, that, once you've lost that battle, basically we're trying to protect the environment, uh, including water, air, and soil quality, and to prevent the spread of disease. So those are our primary goals. Within those, we also want to abide by whatever the regulations are in the place that we are. And so those vary from state to state. And it's, it'll be important uh, in each of your cases to know what those rules are in your own home state. So I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the different methods that are used, and then we're gonna zero in on mortality composting. So carcass abandonment, this is the one illegal option that we'll mention here. In Colorado, we call this the coyote rendering service. But, uh, so we try to avoid this, but in more remote areas, it's not unusual uh, for this to happen. And so there are issues with that, ranging from disease issues, water quality issues, scavengers, odors, all kinds of things that can be an issue with this. So we try to discourage this practice a couple other practices are incineration and burning. Now these two are basically the same thing, except that burn that when, when I say burning, it's out, open outdoor burning, and incineration is burning in a controlled incinerator. So an incinerator has to be properly engineered, and it, it controls emissions, where the outdoor burning has no control over emissions. So that's one big difference between these two. In addition to that, both of them require high fuel consumption, but in outdoor burning, it's especially difficult to control the burn and make sure it's a thorough burn of all of the carcasses that you're trying to burn. So it's usually used primarily in emergencies when you just don't know what else to do and you've got to deal with some uh, carcasses. Another commonly used option is burial, and th that's fairly straightforward. But there are uh, important consideration in that for burial as well, especially related to uh, water quality uh, and preventing water quality problems. So uh, many places have requirements for how, how far away you are from surface water bodies or groundwater, how deep you bury and how much soil is put on top. And so those, uh, that kind of, uh, those criteria are sometimes part of a, a requirement to get a permit to, before you bury animals. Landfilling is kind of a, 
another form of burying, but uh, in this case, it'll, it's most important to know that many landfills will not accept dead animals, so you have to make sure that you are, have a landfill that will accept them. And then, uh, landfill also doesn't provide any transportation and that kind of thing, so you have to provide your own transportation and then also pay tipping fees at the landfill. So this is usually a pretty expensive option. Rendering is an option that used to be much more common than it is today, at least in, in Colorado and in the states we've been dealing with in this project. So rendering uh, is a, a heat-driven process where they separate different products from animal tissues and then sell those products. So in the past, renderers had regular pickup schedules and they would pay for carcasses. But in, over the last several years, this has become less and less common and uh, what you got paid got less and less and in many cases, now you actually have to pay to get the, the carcasses removed. And it was really these changes to rendering that caused us to focus on composting as a, as a viable option because rendering basically went away. <clears throat> so composting. I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction about general composting just to get us all on the same page. And then, then Michael will focus in on how composting uh, mortalities is different from regular composting. So, of, of course, you all know that composting is a natural process, but it's a microbial process, and so what we have to do is provide the environment that's optimum for the microbes to do their job of decomposition. A couple of things that we really wanted to explore in this project were we, we, had, we had heard about and been around composting of small animals like poultry, but we're less certain about how this would work with, with beef cattle um, and did they need to be prepared and that kind of thing. So we've uh, gotten into that a bit in the manual. And, and the other concern was, does it really work in cold areas like in Montana? And you'll see in, in the uh, upcoming slides that it does work in both extremes of the re region that we focused on, in the cold region in Montana and then the very hot and dry areas of New Mexico, composting does work. But there are some special considerations in both sides of that. And one of the big benefits of composting, of course, is that you're not wasting the nutrients that are in the animal, that, they, that many of the nutrients will be captured and can be recycled into a usable end product. So that's really a big benefit of composting. This is a definition from the uh, Field Guide to On-Farm Composting, which I, I think is a really great definition of composting. It says, composting is a managed biological oxidation process that converts heterogeneous organic matter into a more homogeneous fine particle humus-like material. There are two words in there that I'd like to point out. Oops, not that way. Okay, I'll just tell you verbally <laughs> that the, one of them is managed. Uh, so uh, sometimes people say they're composting when they aren't really, they're just piled up manure and they aren't really managing it. And so I think that that, uh, that word managed is an important word in the compost definition that it does require maintenance and management. Another important one is oxidation, is that this is an aerobic process and, and uh, there's no such thing as anaerobic composting, that's called fermentation. So, so uh, that's, those are two key things that define composting. So as I mentioned before, it's really the microorganisms that do the composting, and so what we try to do is supply for the microbes what they need to be healthy and do their job. So they basically need four things. They need carbon and nitrogen, and those are uh, in balance with each other. In the composting world, they like to talk about greens as nitrogen sources and brown materials as carbon sources, and it's important to have a mixture of both of those. The other balance that's really important is to have oxygen and water in balance. You don't want it to be too dry or too wet in order for the microbes to be able to uh, grow quickly and decompose the materials. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio we typically use when we're giving composting trainings is 30 to 1, but this is what we aim for. 
However, when we're dealing with mortalities, this is basically impossible to achieve. So for two reasons. One is you're not really mixing your ingredients like you do in a normal compost pile. And then secondly, as you'll see in a few minutes, when you compost deads, you have to provide a carbonaceous layer underneath the material and we have also put a carbonaceous cap over the top. And so those tend to drive that carbon to nit nitrogen ratio much higher than what we would usually use in normal composting. But it still works. It, it uh, just goes a little slower than, than a typical composting process. Another thing that's quite different in mortality composting is that how we supply oxygen. Okay? And so normally, we supply oxygen by turning the piles. And at the beginning of composting, we might co turn every week or every two weeks, depending on the temperature in the pile. But you don't do that when you've got large carcasses in the compost pile, because we want them to compost further before we mess with them. Okay? So, so we have to supply oxygen in a passive way. And that, that's another reason why we've got to have this uh, carbonaceous layer, usually, usually wood chip, something coarse, underneath the, the mortalities, so that there can be passive aeration through the bottom of the pile and up through the pile. So uh, with that said, it's time for me to pass the microphone to Michael to go into more detail about mortality composting itself. <laughs>